Hi everyone, my name is Kalisa Christ and I'm a recent graduate from UChicago in the CDAC Summer Lab Program. I'm extremely excited to introduce Dr. Anjali Adukia, Assistant Professor at the UChicago Harris School of Public Policy and Dr. Dora Saz, Image Analysis Specialist at RCC. Dr. Adukia's research has historically centered around public policy and more specifically, how to reduce inequalities that children face while Dr. Saz's research at RCC, excuse me, my throat, um, at RCC has revolved around the intersection of image analysis and AI in a variety of fields. Today, they're going to speak more in detail about how they navigate the unique challenges that arise when applying AI-driven computer vision tools to a range of domains such as public policy. I have the pleasure of working with both Dr. Dukiam and Dr. Saz as a research assistant this summer, and so I'm especially excited for everyone to have the opportunity to hear more about what these amazing women have accomplished in the past, as well as the extensive applications of their current research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dukiam and Dr. Saz to the Summer Lab Speaker Series. Great, thank you so much, Kalista, for that introduction. And I have to say that we love Kalista and we're so grateful to have her in our team. Uh, I can't even imagine what it was like to not have her in our team. And so um, thank you to CDAC for bringing her to us and pleased to thank you for everything. It's been a, beyond a pleasure. And so, you know, one thing that um, Katie had mentioned is that people really like it'd be useful to talk about our journeys here and kind of like what brought us to the questions and, you know, something that Dora and I were talking a lot about is that we each have such different paths. And so for me, I started out planning to get my MD PhD. Um, in high school, I worked in a lab as an RA doing research in pediatric oncology and then continued doing research in college. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, I was also really active in various student organizations focused on service and diversity. Um, and there was a real a turning point. And I loved like I had been thinking about it since I was a child. Um, but uh, there was a real turning point the uh, summer before my senior year. There was a neo-Nazi hate crime shooting spree that had started in Chicago and then made its way south. I was at the University of Illinois um, at Urbana-Champaign. And, you know, there had been all this talk about, you know, this group making my college town a hub of white supremacy. And it was, we were like, no, not, not in our backyard, not here. And you know, so we started um, being very active in that world and um, in terms of like anti-hate, anti-violence type work. And I found myself daydreaming in my favorite class, CSB 308 immunology, that the white blood cells were instead taking away the hate of white supremacy. And um, it really made me think about like, okay, what do I want to do in my life? You know, the thing about being a doctor is that there's a lot of individual change, which is really important. But you know, I really wanted to be involved in systemic change. So I decided to put off medicine for a while and work in nonprofits, still thinking that I would one day go back to medicine. So after graduation, I moved to San Francisco, um, working in nonprofits. And then a year later, 9-11 happened, you know, and suddenly there were, you know, little brown kids were getting bullied all around the nation. And even in Berkeley, California, you know, the bastion of liberalness, you know, this child got his head beaten into the sidewalk such that there were blood stains uh, and the superintendent called it an isolated incident. And I thought, oh my gosh, if this is happening in Berkeley, what the heck is going on in Idaho or in my very small town in Illinois? So, and I kept thinking, you know, where do people learn these biases? How do we change uh, uh, what, how, how people think about the world and, you know, about their own identity and how they view others? And, you know, it starts young, but and, but unfortunately, decision makers don't pay attention to what preschoolers have to say generally, but they do care about what people in positions of policy or in higher education have to say. And, you know, I started thinking maybe I should get a JD or an MBA, but, you know, at that time, I didn't understand that you could actually apply JDs and MBAs to, you know, social justice. I thought they were really focused on the corporate world. And um, then a friend told me about a master's at Harvard, which was essentially like an MBA, only focused on education and nonprofits. And so, you know, I went and it changed my path. I suddenly thought about, oh, I'll be a superintendent. I'll go to higher ed. I'll be a minister of education. Maybe I'll start some organizations. 
Um, you know, and after that, I worked in higher ed for a year, but then I moved to India to work with NGOs because I really believed that, you know, we need to learn about what's going on outside of the U.S. Um, and my world opened up again. One of the NGOs that I was based at the to improvements in sanitation across India. Gandhi would say that clean, cleanliness was next to godliness. And, you know, this is something that I would revisit later in, in future work. And, but also during that time, there was a major tsunami that hit southern India in December 2004. And so I went down to Tamil Nadu, which is on the southern part of India, to help with rehabilitation efforts. One village would be doing one thing while another village just five kilometers away would be doing something completely different and they would be not really learning from previous disaster situations or very little so. So I wanted to learn best practices and I was emailing with one of my advisors who said, come back to grad school, come get your doctorate, we'll teach you these things. And so I said, all right, you know, I really didn't give it much thought, but I was like, that sounds great. Um, I went to get my doctorate in education and she said in my first year, you know, you think like an economist, you should go take the econ PhD sequence. And I said, no, 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 I don't care about hedge funds or investment banking. And she said, no, nope, you care about resource constraints, trade-offs and scarcity. And that is fundamentally what economics is all about. So I trusted her and it was this wonderful confluence of like what I wanted to do, like trying to deeply understand how the world works, you know, making a meaningful like, you know, impact in, on issues of social justice while, you know, really like learning systematic methods to be able to and I found that the research questions that I cared about kept coming back to fundamental needs. You know, when people work in education in developing contexts or when you work on these questions, people often say, I know, let's give laptops to every child. You know, and look, like while that might be really good and very important, you know, kids are also hungry, they don't feel safe, you know? And so I would think like, well, what happens if we, how further can we get if we try to progress or make progress on these basic needs? And so, you know, fast forward several years, I had been working on issues related to safety and security, you know, including thinking about sanitation in schools, you know, and then I started working on questions related to how school disciplinary systems either exacerbated or ameliorated injustice, you know, because while it's talked about less, justice is also a fundamental need. If you don't feel like you belong, if you don't feel like you're trusted or an intrinsic part of a community, then it's really hard to fully participate as a human being which brings me to representation, because I think representation is also a fundamental need. You know, if you don't see yourself represented in the books around you, the media around you, you know, it, it's hard to feel like you completely belong, that you are supposed to be there, right? You know, the process of education, you know, and, and indeed the materials that are a part of education, you know, necessarily and by design, reflect and transmit the values of society and define whose space it is, right? And, you know, when society is a systemically racist and sexist one, then those educational materials or books or, you know, TV shows or songs often mirror those, those values back to children who then learn to view themselves through the lens of those same biases. And, you know, this re recursive process can reinforce and exacerbate these extreme sociocultural inequalities that are at the heart of so many disparities in educational outcomes. You know, I grew up in a predominantly small, in a, you know, in a, in a small town with predominantly white classmates and surrounded by standard American books filled with predominantly white characters, mostly male or female characters in stereotypical roles. And I didn't see myself in any of them. Which brings me to this current project, you know, where we're really trying to systematically measure messages, you know, that are sent to children, whether they're about race or gender or their abilities, um, you know, and often when people, especially in education, want to study these questions, they like go by hand and, and you know, really try to understand books deeply. But it's actually been super exciting to connect these social science questions with the skills and tools of, you know, computer scientists like Dora and Kalista and, you know, to think about how can we, you know, use systematic approaches to like 
you know, identify the images or the text in books and then try to see, you know, what are the messages that are being sent to kids. So I will, uh, who will take it from here. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, it was wonderful to find out more about you. <laughs> and sorry, I've been late. Um, could you repeat what, what, what is the, the kind of the pipeline of what we should say? Sorry. So I was, I was just giving my kind of like what brought me to want to, to, to be studying these questions. And... Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you as well uh, a bit of um, my background. So um, I'm originally from Romania and uh, I did their um, bachelor degree in telecommunications uh, and I really got fascinated about signal processing and networking and um, and visuals. <laughs> um, so the next thing that um, I was kind of curious about was multimedia technologies, uh, where I went for a master degree there. Um, and then I, um, I started thinking uh, in, in during this period while I was doing uh, multimedia technologies, I got involved with um, through my signal processing passion uh, with a um, company in Germany where they were doing deep brain stimulation in, in the brain of patients. And um, it was my first kind of surgery to see uh, where, where I could see how helpful whatever I do in the medical domain uh, is for patients and how direct is this connection, patient and, well, student worker. <laughs> um, and I just got fascinated about that. And um, uh, then an internship arrived um, so I, uh, in France uh, on ultrasound and beamforming. Um, and it was ultrasound medical imaging. So I went for that internship with the idea, oh, I will learn some French and I will see the world. Uh, but then I really got passionate about um, medical imaging ultrasound so i got a french ministry scholarship there for a phd so i spent three years on my phd and um i also was so so enthusiastic that um at the end of the phd i it was this beam forming competition of with the best beam formers in the world for ultrasound where i I won the first prize and I was like very, very, very proud of that. Uh, well, during PhD, I also, uh, I need always to have something that kind of recreational, but still fascinating. So I was into doing wearable electronics. Uh, so I was basically um, uh, associated with a good friend that she was fas fashion designer putting all kinds of LEDs in dresses and make them fashionable. And we went together and he taught a workshop on wearable electronics. So we have, I, have, I have to have, in my case, some, something that it's, it's getting me in other directions so I can stay creative and, um, at, at what I'm doing. Uh, so after the PhD, um, I was looking on, I didn't really want to just focus on one, uh, one domain. So I, uh, I said, okay, it's clear to me that my work, wherever will be next, will be start helping people in image analysis, visualization, maybe signal processing. Um, and this is how I came to Chicago at the University of Chicago, where I'm uh, computational scientist for Research Computing Center. I think some of you already know, uh, probably you saw me in the workshops on deep learning, transfer learning, computer vision. So uh, those workshops, um, like the next one I, I am giving is uh, on uh, COVID-19 um, and deep learning and imaging. Um, and it will be really, really focused. Um, so 
for, for research computing. And I don't know if you know, in CRERA, there is this so-called well, data visualization laboratory or visualization lab where we, um, I usually, we have this big screen, uh, 22 feet by eight feet, where usually I like to give uh, my, my workshops there. But right now, well, <laughs> right now it's just uh, staying and waiting for us. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of leading also this visualization lab and um, I'm um, the technical lead in the project with Anjali and Callista. Uh, on the image side. Um, and another project that I have, it's also in medical imaging with um, just prostate cancer detection. So uh, if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk more about this. I don't know how much time I still have. Any time or, <laughs> Katie? Yeah, so we have um, maybe like five or seven more minutes um and okay. it'd be great to hear uh, like specifically about the project on like measuring uh race and gender in the children's books and kind of how that um is an interesting kind of case study and problem of image analysis um specifically mm -hmm. you know within public policy but yeah this is great uh -huh. guys. okay perfect so um Angeli, i'm correct that we reserved the two minutes for the video right at the end. So we have about, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> I didn't hear the, yes, but I, I could read the lips. That's the next project probably. <laughs> um, so specifically with Angelis um, and their measuring um, the, um, the race and the identity um, in, in the textbooks and in the child book, we are um, and specifically for image analysis, we are very much focused on um, looking um, at, yeah, looking at the gender and the age and races and uh, even skin color. Um, so we have this big collection of, of books that uh, we are looking um, at finding automatic ways to uh, extract all of these features, even actions, actions between people, um, ap actions, human object. Um, so for these, uh, we started with this tool, uh, Google Vision API, which is, uh, I really recommend you to give it a try. Um, I don't know, can I share screen, Katie? Yes, you can share your screen. Okay, thank you. Let me just share a bit. <laughs> So, so if you want to try a Google Vision API, um, it's at google.com vision, and you can just upload an image and um, you will be able to, I think I have uh, some images. You, you will be able definitely get some, some good results uh, already. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was not for me. Um, and then, so you, you can already see, oh, this was a cat, an animal. Um, so I really recommend you to try that. Um, and uh, so we started from there uh, and then we went uh, to, and we built more complicated ways on uh, of course, at Google, you, you cannot just get, oh, what's the race of this person? <laughs> Probably for animals, but not for, for human beings. Um, and we also went into trying some transfer learning methods and deep learning models where we basically took public data sets and we trained them with um, we train the models with the public data, but then we um, test it on our data. And then we realize that in our, the challenges that we have in the books is that we have illustrations, we have um, text, we have uh, photos, we have different drawings that come with different artists. Um, we have grayscale images, we have color images. So how we can 
kind of create a standard or a way to represent this diversity um, in, in images and then how to correlate them with that. Um, so Kalista, she, she's been very, very helpful on uh, using um, a method called uh, K-means clustering to basically look at a face, um, at the skin of the face. So we have a method that segments the skin and then uh, look what are the primary colors that appear in this face and then decide um, based on some scales. Uh, like for example, there is a Fitzpatrick scale that uh, is very common for dermatologists to use on classifying skin. So this is what she has been doing. Um, and now I'm going to just um, a very shortly show you a video on how our methods actually work on us. So just bear with me. Uh, Optify sharing. All right. I will let I, I finish on my side. <laughs> and that basically showcases, you know, just some of the, the methods that, you know, can help identify or, or pull out some of the characteristics from images that, you know, maybe some of the messages that may be implicitly sent, you know, to whoever the reader is. And in our case, we're particularly looking at children and, and focusing on children's books. Um, but, you know, this was fun. Dora had put this together for our team and really kind of show, showing like, how do these methods work just on simple pictures from the different members of our team. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Is all, all good to, to wrap up or um, anything else on your side? 
and we're and we're happy to answer questions and you know talk about whatever it is that would be useful uh, or that people are interested in. We could talk more about the project, talk more about whatever it is that um, yeah would be of interest. You know, Dora's mentioned like that it's not just applying these tools to you know questions around education, but you know also to curriculum. You know, she's doing stuff related to COVID nineteen and trying to you know use image analysis methods to try to understand you know. How to uh, how to detect these things? So you know, we're happy to talk about anything that people are interested in. Awesome! Thank you both. That's really exciting work. Um, I also love the soundtrack on that video. Um, so thank you, uh, Dora and Anjali. Um, we're now going to throw it over to our second speaker. Um, but before we head to her, um, we have an intro from Helena. Hi. I'm Helena Abney McPeak. I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University in the CDAC summer program. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sandra Schloen, co-creator along with David Schloen and manager of the OCHRE Data Service. That stands for Online Cultural and Historical Research Environment. And it's part of the Oriental Institute here at UChicago. Dr. Schloen has worked professionally as a software engineer for a long time, both in academic and in business settings before coming to Chicago. Her specialties are in complex database systems, applications of technology to educational contexts, as well as scholarly research applications of software development in general. I actually have the privilege of getting to work with Dr. Schloen and her colleague, Dr. Miller Prosser, as a research assistant this summer. And so I'm especially excited for all of you to have the opportunity to hear more about the exciting and groundbreaking work that she has been doing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandy Schloen to the Summer Lab Speaker Series. Thank you, Helena. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and Katie, I I'd like to share my screen here. So uh, hopefully that's working well. Yes, all good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And at the Ochre Data Server, where we support the data integration, analysis, and publication for dozens of mostly humanities projects that span a wide range of space and time, we are used to pictures that tell stories. This aerial picture, for example, which serves as a base map in Ochre, tells a story of looters digging pits at the famous archaeology center poor in Iraq to uncover ancient artifacts to sell in the black market. These images managed by Ochre tell the story of harpoon blades found unexpectedly in the middle of the Sahara Desert, reminding us that once the Sahara was green. In this same space, but in the land before time, the remains of ancient creatures remind us that we were not Earth's first inhabitants, this being a flesh model of the Nigersaurus discovered and named by U Chicago's paleontologist Paul Serena. Human skulls from the same site in central Niger, from the Peruvian Valley and from the coast of Israel, give us glimpses of the story of humankind. Such stories are what we owe to the studies in the humanities. But the story that I really want to tell today is set in the ancient city of Persepolis, located in modern day central Iran. Built by the Persian king Darius the Great over 2,500 years ago, Persepolis was a monumental complex of palaces, royal tombs, treasury, and fortifications, and the administrative seat of a vast Persian empire. But the splendor of Persepolis lasted only two centuries when Alexander the Great came in conquest, carried away the treasure, and put the city to the torch, causing a great inferno. Fast forward to the 1930s when the Oriental Institute sent an expedition to explore the ruins. Uncovered in the debris of the treasury were 20 to 30,000 clay tablets with inscriptions written in the Elamite language using cuneiform script. The technology of the day, the telegram, sent this exciting news back to Chicago. The Persepolis Fortification Archive Project was tasked with studying the tablets and fragments recovered from this site, and ironically, were it not for the great fire that destroyed the city and thereby baked these tablets in its intense heat, 
these tablets would have crumbled to dust long ago. In 2006, Professor Matthew Stolper, the Elamite expert at the Oriental Institute, began an important effort to photograph this archive using modern techniques in anticipation of returning this collection on loan from Iran. Among the 80-some terabytes of image data currently being managed by the OCA platform are thousands of conventional photographs of the front, back, and edges of the tablets, thousands of super high resolution images created using specialized equipment and filtered lighting, and thousands more images generated using this odd looking dome shaped contraption rigged with a camera and 32 stationary lights. This special photographic technique called RTI is particularly useful on low relief objects or with those with texture and shadow like our tablets. 32 separate images, each shot using a different light source, are computationally stitched together into a composite image, which the user can manipulate to control the direction of the light source and examine the tablet surface interactively. But the most challenging part is reading and deciphering these tablets. The text turned out to be mostly mundane administrative matters. A hundred measures of wheat were given on this day of this year. But the whole is greater than the sum of its fragments, giving us a rich view into the past. Using Ochre's highly granular, comprehensive, item-based approach to data management, Stolper, his students, and an international team of specialists have amassed a huge digital resource based on this archive, tightly integrating both textual and image data. One of Ochre's most uh, powerful linking mechanisms is a technique we call hotspotting. It's used extensively by our archaeology projects. We tag people or artifacts Facebook style and delimit boundaries of excavated dirt. Ochre's hotspots link database items of any kind to polygon-shaped pixel regions of an image. Taking inspiration from this, Stolper put his students to work hotspotting images of the tablets to document the sign-by-sign -sign readings of the scholar and also as a pedagogic exercise. Ochre's synchronized view lets a student march across the tablet, image uh, sign by sign, comparing the highlighted text with the highlighted part of the image. Hotspotting became a regular part of the workflow and over 10 years later, it occurred to me to wonder. I did an Ochre query and discovered that over 6,000 tablet images had been hotspotted yielding not hundreds, not thousands, not tens of thousands, but over a hundred thousand hotspots. And over the same passage of time, machine learning had become mainstream and we wondered right away, do we have enough data to train a machine to learn to read cuneiform? So with hotspots in hand, we reached out to computer scientists with expertise in machine learning, the outcome being DeepScribe, a collaborative project between computer scientists whose names are shown here in white and cuneiform scholars who, whose names are shown in maroon. And I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, many of whom are joining us on this call this morning. Uh, a special shout out to uh, Eddie Williams, our machine learning specialist working with us from Los Angeles. Uh, his volunteer efforts showed the early promise of our data set and gave us confidence to conscript Professor Christian from New Chicago's computer science department, who's an expert in computer vision, and Professor Paulus from the Orient Institute, who's a specialist in cuneiform. We were especially delighted and grateful to be awarded as CDAC Discovery Grant for this year to pursue this research together. That my name, Sandra Sloan, is neither in white nor maroon, correctly identifies me as neither an expert in computer vision nor cuneiform. But my training in computer science and my expertise as a software developer Paired with 30 years of working with academics in the humanities gives me a solid footing on which to walk that middle ground between the technical experts and the subject matter experts. Back in the day when I studied artificial intelligence with some of the pioneers in the field at the University of Toronto, the focus was all on symbolic logic, using reasoning and logic to solve problems. If we could build knowledge representation systems that organize enough structured data and formulate enough rules to describe that data, we could design expert systems that use computers to reason. It's large, it's a mammal, it's gray, so it must be an elephant. In your lifetime, that of the students watching today, 
artificial intelligence has been transformed by incredible advances in both hardware and software, by the phenomenon of big data like the ImageNet image database with over 14 million annotated images, and by significant improvements in machine learning algorithms, those that can reach conclusions or make predictions not because they've been programmed to do so according to a set of rules, but because they're examining the data itself and learning from it. There are many branches of this field, but our focus today is on using supervised deep learning. In the context of image processing, deep learning is characterized by the repeated transformation of input data, like a matrix of pixels, through multiple layers of abstraction or generalization, with each layer progressively detecting and abstracting higher level features than the one before, learning as it does this over and over in the hope of identifying the objects in the image. This learning is considered to be supervised when we give the model not only the question, what's in this picture, but also the expected answer. If the model is trained on enough examples of elephants, it will learn in its own way to recognize elephants. Despite the current sophistication of computer vision techniques like optical character recognition, teaching a model seemed to us to be much uh, teaching a model cuneiform seemed to us to be much harder. It was helpful when Professor Krishnan explained that it was not so, matter, not so much a matter of complex image recognition, but simply an age-old and familiar classification task. It reminded me of my favorite Sesame Street segment, which played from its very first episode in 1969 through to its 50th anniversary. If you see enough examples of a starfish, an E, a triangle, or a two, you can learn to recognize many more. Here is a sample of the popular MNIST image database of handwritten digits. It's a labeled training set widely used for training and testing machine learning models for image recognition. Once we had extracted our deep scribed image hotspots as cutouts, labeled them with the cuneiform sign to which the hotspot was linked, this is exactly what we had, an extensive labeled machine learning training data set. Here is one of the most frequently attested signs in our collection, 6,000 exemplars. Each cuneiform sign represents a class in our classification scheme, and we have about 180 signs or classes. The general strategy of machine learning is to hold back some portion, say 20% of the data set for testing the model, using the rest as training input and validation. Once trained, we then run the test set through the model to see how well it predicts the right outcomes. DeepScribe uses convolutional neural networks which are well suited for image processing. A convolution is a process that runs a filter of some kind over the image, like an average of the colors of a region of the image, to produce another image in a new layer of greatly reduced complexity, but one that still retains essential information to distinguish different classes, like a six from a seven. The model convolves over and over many layers deep that predicts the answer. If the answer is wrong, it uses a process called backpropagation to learn from its mistakes and refine the model. Backpropagation was such a game changer that the scholar who made it popular, Jeffrey Hinton, professor at my alma mater at the University of Toronto, is considered by many to be the godfather of deep learning. For DeepScribe, we do a little bit of pre-processing to make our cutouts more uniform, 100 by 100 pixels in grayscale. Then we train the model with tens of thousands of exemplars over many iterations or epochs. Early on, Professor Krishnan wondered if we were gonna get off easy in the event that existing computer vision models trained on other scripts would work for our data set and our script. With the thanks of our CDAC summer intern, Grace Sue, who processed our data against the MNIST model of handwritten digits, we learned that the answer is a decisive no. But Eddie, our machine learning consultant, had already run a proof of concept in AlexNet to confirm that our data set was indeed worthy of training a convolutional model. Alex was a PhD student at the University of Toronto who in 2012 blew minds and set a new standard with his winning algorithms at the industry's annual computer vision contest. Using just the top four most highly attested signs in our hotspot collection 
And he experimented with a 2014 contest winning neural network, gaining significant but not very satisfactory improvement. The more powerful 2015 contest winning neural network brought our results quickly up to around 80%. And to date, after much more experimentation, our best top five result, uh, that is the probability that the correct prediction of the cuneiform sign is one of the top five suggested by the model, those results reached 90% in some cases. While we are excited by these findings, we are still a long way from our goal of reading cuneiform. And we have learned that our data set is prone to some common machine learning issues. Sometimes the model will work extremely well in the training data set, but does not generalize well to new data, a problem called overfitting. It's much like the kid who wins a spelling bee by memorizing the dictionary, but he hasn't learned about Latin roots, prefixes, or plurals, and so can't spell a new word he's never seen before. Another problem is that our data set is quite badly skewed. We have a few signs with a great many hotspot exemplars and a great many signs with only a few exemplars, which biases the prediction in favor of the most popular signs. We've seen some success using a process called regularization based on linear regression models to reduce overfitting, as well as data augmentation, which involves applying a slight transformation to the images, like a shift, a shear, a zoom, or a blur to make the exemplars a bit more varied. We're also experimenting with other image processing techniques, like increasing contrast to adjust for differences in lighting or shadows. Although we're finding that our model isn't particularly sensitive to uh, those types of adjustments. We're also judiciously culling using uh, our useless hotspots from our training set and trying to supplement our inventory of underrepresented signs. But rather than trying to squeeze more accuracy from the neural network, we're now working to complement the visual model with the model of the Elamite language. And if we are successful for Elamite texts, our hope is that this process will adapt to other languages that use the cuneiform script over its 3,000 year lifespan. Because the language of these texts is quite formulaic, the language model can provide context for the predictions from the neural network. If certain signs never appear in sequence together, those combinations can be eliminated as probable. Signs that do appear in formulaic phrases can give credence to matching predictions. For example, the word shebar mesh, shown in yellow here, means barley and is usually preceded by some quantity or measure, followed by the term corman, meaning an allotment, followed in turn by a personal name indicated by our sign how. For example, 40 measures of barley were allotted to so-and-so. This formulaic phrase applies to other quantities, other commodities, and other so-and-sos. We generated a serialized version of Ochre's inventory of over 8,000 sign-by-sign transliterated texts to use as input to a forward-backward algorithm, which we hope will help give context for less frequently attested signs and bolster the success rate of predicting plausible outcomes overall. But what's the point of trying to apply DeepScribe to a new set of tablets of a different language if that's going to require 100,000 manually entered hotspots? So we're also working to automatically detect the relevant boundaries of the sign using a region proposal network. This is much the same strategy that self-driving cars use to detect pedestrians, other vehicles, or obstacles. I, for one, am really interested uh, to see how this goes. And finally, the ultimate goal is to integrate DeepScribe as a tool in Ochre for use by scholars. We have a number of Ochre wizards already that guide scholars through analyzing the texts. So to these, we will add a DeepScribe wizard to integrate the technologies I've described this morning. Giving a wizard access to Ochre's integrated corpus-based dictionary for matching against known words, we aspire to achieve at least a basic transcription of a text having started only from an image of the tablet. Overall, we still have more questions than answers, but we look forward to giving future updates. Uh, these are incredible technologies, but surprisingly accessible. And I've listed here some of the software we've used, and I encourage you to get the free downloads and try the tutorials. As I wrap up, the moral of the story for me is that artificial intelligence is just math. 
math and statistics paired with high performance computing. So students, don't begrudge your math and stats requirements. And we've also learned some other good lessons I'd like to share. Make every effort to capture data as richly and granularly as possible for potential reuse for purposes you have not even yet imagined. As students tediously hot-spotted tablets, we had no idea we would be on the forefront of artificial intelligence years later. Don't underestimate the value of data integration. Oker's item-based approach paired with extensive integration has given us an unprecedented context for this research project. Take the time to learn the language of your non-technical users. While technology is fun for its own sake, it's especially rewarding to use it to solve actual research problems. Collaborate, get out there and meet people. Eddie and I were connected by a mere acquaintance who had seen Oka presentations at conferences. Professor Christian and I met at a conference dinner, discovering that we had overlapping interests. DeepScribe would not be possible without intense collaboration. And finally, those of you studying computer science need to prepare yourself to be lifelong learners. Our field is too vast and ever-changing to master it, so never be afraid to admit what you don't know. I personally have undoubtedly learned as much as our interns have this summer. Uh, speaking of whom, I'd like to thank Grace and Helena both for all their hard work, and Helena for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure having you both on our team, and many thanks to the CDAC organizers for this opportunity to speak today with you. And I realize that my opening and closing photograph has nothing to do with my topic, but it's a story for me of my son as a high schooler, surrounded by PhDs on our archaeology team. Yet having grown up with technology, he was the best equipped to use the latest remote controlled drone technology here in this beautiful setting in South Central Turkey. And it's also a reminder for me, for my friends and colleagues in the humanities, always to value the stories of the past. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Sandy. I feel like that moral of the story should be highlighted and blown up on our, our Slack channel. There are some really valuable lessons there. Um, all right, well, thank you, Sandy, Dora, and Anjali. Um, we have uh, some time left now for questions. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just open it up um, for questions. And um, all of our students have asked questions in your uh, cluster channel. Um, so if you would like to be the first brave soul, um, feel free to either just unmute yourself and ask um, or raise your hand as well and we'll point the mic over to you. If not, we will call on people. I'm, I'll pull a Kyle and just call people out. Um, so I have a question. Great, go for it, Chinmaya. So um, what are some challenges you face when having to obtain so much data for your deep learning models? Great, so a question about obtaining data to train these sets. In, uh, I'll just speak to that in our case. Uh, we got really lucky. We didn't know that this was going to be a good data set for uh, training machine learning algorithms. Um, so it was, it was more than a coincidence, but just a, a natural um, byproduct of work that was already being done. And we captured the data in such a way that it was uh, very useful to transform it to be a, a, you know, worthy for this process. We'd hate to have to start again and start from scratch to try and do this. So we were we were just really excited to have a, a data set that had had happened along the way of other research. Um, and really, you wanted to go ahead, Dora. Please. Yeah. So in our case, um, we were mostly uh, looking at oh, what we can have as public data and use. Um, millions of images or have models that were trained on this data to, um, to to predict what we wanted as features like age, gender and skin and actions and but 
we realized that majority of uh, public data sets were just photos. So, and we were having heavily um, data about illustrations where um, some of the illustrations, like what, what is a character? Is a character an animal that's um, personified? Is the character an object that's personified? Now, what's the age of that animal or character that's even not human? So, and the other thing is um, um, we were also facing, uh, and we are currently facing a lot of balancing problem. Uh, so not having a balanced data, you know, there are several methods to deal with that. <laughs> One is just getting rid of the, the data that's a plus or having to uh, start and look at um, uh, weighted loss functions. So it's, it's really, really um, hard, especially to get good label data. Another, another problem we are actually currently facing is how do we define the skin labels, <laughs> especially for the characters that are objects or animals. Um, and what are the ranges of colors we, we, we can um, label this data. Um, and not so much data yet. So that's a challenge here. All these uh, um, models need a lot of data that's very well labeled. Um, so that's why we also make a lot of use of um, transfer learning in our situations. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of add to that, because we're interested in both gender and race, if you think about wanting to assess, well, you know, how has like representation of gender changed over time? You know, if we want to be able to take into account, you know, non-binary or gender fluid um, identities, like, you know, it, a lot of these algorithms are, you know, designed to say, oh, you have a bow in your hair, you're wearing, you know, a triangle bottom. And so then you're going to be more likely to be classified as female rather than male. And so, you know, how do we think about that? And, you know, uh, you know, as, as Dora said, like, there are these issues with grayscale and so much of, of children's literature is this fantastical world. And, um, but what we want to be able to see is like we were trying very much to think about like if we can look at this through the eyes of children, you know, like what is it that they, what are the messages that they are getting? And so uh, Dora always has the great ideas that we should bring in our own children to help manually code things and help train our data sets, which actually has been very enlightening for all of us, you know, where, you know, as a team, we'll sometimes each look at the same set of faces and it's interesting how we each classify them in different ways. And so really trying to think about like, what is ground truth when it comes to a lot of these attributes versus not, uh, yeah, there are a lot of different challenges and especially with children's literature that we just don't have very much training data. Well, one thing I want to also add, um, because we are actually working on uh, just diversity and uh, all this, making sure that our data is not biased one way or the other and making sure we, we follow well all these ethics and bias that exist in data <laughs> sets and in data science in general. So that's a big, big issue that um, we are currently looking at. Great. Thank you both. Um, Pei Ching, I think you raised your hand. Feel free to ask your question. Uh, yeah, well, um, I've got a question. So in the realm of archaeology study, we meet a bunch of different characters, such like Sumerian or Arahatic character. So when dealing with different kinds of languages, when we have to decipher them, what does the model that we use that have in common and what is the difference between them? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if, if I can just um, respond to that, we're, we're hoping to use 
different language models for different uh, languages while using the same visual model. So our visual model is agnostic as to language. It's just sort of recognizing symbols. Um, but we hope that we'll be able to generate different language models based on transliterations of texts from different languages. And uh, we have you know, scholars that study all these languages right here at the Oriental Institute. And uh, Ochre has a huge database of other texts in other languages as well. So um, we're, we're well equipped, I think, to try this. And um, um, Suzanne, did you wanna add a comment there? My colleague. Yeah, I saw like, that's a good point where I can chime in. Um, so what they do have in common is like the languages we're interested in, they are all using the cuneiform script. And this is like a very complex, as you've seen from the photos, complex script system, which is based on logograms, like pictographic signs, but also syllabs. And yeah, all the languages do have in common that they use the script and the script was used for over 3,000 years. So we have a lot of good data also on those texts because they were not really in the data doesn't decay. So yeah, pretty much, I don't know. Help, but. That's great. And Suzanne, do you mind uh, mentioning a little bit about who you are on the team and uh, what expertise you're bringing? I think it's implied in your answer, but we could say more. Yeah, I, I think I was one of uh, Sandy's red people. Um, I like the color coding she used. Um, so I'm a cuneiformist, just a specialist learning and teaching and reading text in cuneiform languages. Um, my knowledge in everything like I'm obviously using databases but I'm not coding or doing those kind of things so cool uh, and I should also notice that um, for some that's also interesting as a human like someone from the humanities I stumbled into two of those projects I was very honored to be asked to be a part of the deep scribe but for another project we are looking at the geochemical composition of tablets and we also ended up using AI so it's like really interesting to have those connections. That's very cool thank you it's amazing to see the interdisciplinary collaborative teams on both of these projects and kind of how those marriages happened to, to make this work. All right so I think we have time for one more question um, so feel free to raise your hand or unmute. If not, I have a question on hand that I am happy to happy to call out. A few people raised hands. Great. Great. I have a question, but I'll wait if if a student has one first. Go ahead. I think we we have the other one answered. Okay. Um, so this was super interesting to hear um, to have these talks together to hear about kind of some similar challenges between um, using existing machine learning techniques, but having to tweak them to meet these new contexts. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit more about um, in the cuneiform example, like it's interesting to me that um, compared to the MNIST data set of like handwritten images, which is 2D, you have these 2D representations of these 3D, um, tablets and I'm wondering like if there's anything you've had to do to kind of take advantage of like maybe information that's really encoded in the dimensions of like the the actual inscriptions rather than like treating them as a flat or maybe that had to do with how they were photographed I'm just curious about that like 3d to 2d mapping and I think my parallel question for Anjali's group is kind of we know about all these existing algorithms for facial recognition using images, but I'm curious what challenges have been specific to illustrations. Um, I saw Kalista's presentation a few weeks ago, and I thought that 
uh, that was an interesting problem to me of like, what have you had to do differently to recognize drawings versus images? I, I'm, I'm glad you asked. And that's one of the reasons I showed you the RTI example, because we have this whole other a uh, huge set of images that really does try and capture some of the dimensionality of the tablets. And we've, we've talked am amongst our group about this, and I see um, Professor Krishnan has, has joined us here. And, uh, you know, is, is this something useful for us um, to pursue? And he's more qualified than I am to explain why or why not. Yeah, sure. I, I, can, I, can, I can jump in a little bit to the best my knowledge of like what most of the, uh, the the classifications we're doing right now, the the actual information is in the plane. It's in two D, even though the picture is of a three D tablet. Uh, and actually, in some sense, we've made a concerted effort not to take advantage of any information that is not simply the inscription, right? Because you wouldn't want some sort of a bias creeping in that like all of the tablets of a certain color or of a certain texture had some correlation with a certain sign, like some person's name showed up in tablets that were photographed in one way, right? That's not a meaningful piece of information that we should be kind of keying into. So we've actually made a concerted effort not to take advantage of uh, that type of information. I think what's more interesting to me is the fact that the MNIST model didn't work at all, like uh, like frankly, on the on on this on this data set, which I think comes to the fact that uh, just you know like uh, the the quality of the data on MNIST is like these are black and white images. They are nice, well and centered compared to the diversity of images that we get uh, with just taking this real data. I think is much it's a much harder recognition task. I think where the RTI is going to really come in is like when we start thinking about other tablets, things that are less well read situations where in one lighting situation you can you can you you can clearly see a sign but in another you can't all of that information in my opinion should be going into a neural network you should be treating all of those different light angles as different channels going into a network and the network should be able to understand which ones are going to be relevant on which signs so i think that 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 to me is a very very cool computer vision problem it's like uh it's it's and, and i think it hopefully studying that as both a contribution on the computer science side as well as a contribution on the archaeology side if we can come up with new types of network architectures to do that thank you awesome well thank you everyone i'm i'm conscious of time just because we we asked uh, our speakers only to be here until noon um i feel like we could go on for a long time talking about the the complexities and challenges of applying image analysis techniques uh to these different domains um, so d join me in just saying thank you to uh, Anjali, Dora, Sandy, uh, Suzanne, and Sanjay. Um, uh, it was really two interesting and fascinating talks to hear. Um, and also just great to see the, the collaborative teams um, all on one, one call together. That's, that's really special. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh